And um, yeah, it, it seems like my, my trips to the foundation is a hot commodity because everywhere I go now, at the, at the gym, I've been handing out some of those glasses and people come up, oh, you the eclipse lady, and can you tell me, you know, blah, 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 or, <laughs> you know, at the, the rink where my son plays ice hockey, the hockey parents know that I'm, you know, teaching astronomy. So they're like, oh, yeah, you know, well, we can get these eclipse glasses. So so all this is, like, really picking out. Um, but I'm glad to be here. I don't know how well this presentation is going to go because I've been as information is coming out, basically every day we're getting new information, uh, uh, new and more detailed updates. So I've been incorporating some presentations, changed a little bit from what it was in the spring because we're now just a few days away pretty much. Um, the fonts, since I'm using this computer, the fonts are not exactly the way I intended it, so please bear with me. Um, also, Maybe I'd like a real professional, educational, astronomical outreach professional give you a snazzy intro about eclipses in general. And I don't know how many of you have heard from Dr. Phil Plate. Um, he has this Crash Course Astronomy series, which are 10 minute sections of animation, you know, animated narration of all kinds of introductory astronomy concepts without any math. Um, so I'm actually using those in my in my classes to support my curriculum. Anyway, so let's see uh, what Phil has to say. I was actually we were lucky to meet him in person at um, one of the astronomy meetings a few years back. We humans of planet Earth benefit from a great coincidence. It's a coincidence of time and of space and of math. The coincidence is this. The sun is about 400 times wider than the moon, and it's also, on average, about 400 times farther away than the moon. The apparent size of an object in the sky depends on how big it is and how far away it is. So these numbers being equal means the sun and the moon appear to be about the same size in the sky. And that's where another interesting thing comes in. Sometimes the moon passes directly between the Earth and the sun. Doesn't happen all that often, but when it does, you get magic. Or even better, you get science. You get an eclipse. Okay. It's just the opening sequence, so I didn't want to play the entire thing quite yet. There we go. Okay. Well, our story, you go with my story, starts a long time ago. Um, how many of you have seen eclipses in your lifetime? Um, how many of you have seen a total eclipse? Lucky man! <laughs> <laughs> we try, and you know, since we are normal people on a, on a regular budget, we have to take advantage of all, you know, staying with relatives and stuff like that. And so, this was our first opportunity, really, to try to see a total solar eclipse. And that was August 11, 1999, so almost 18 years ago, yes, before we had children. I mean, we, we had married in 1993. Um, we had moved down here and been employed, tenure track positions go first in 1994. Then um, in 1998, I had tenure track position, did the part-timer, term to term thing. So that's where we are, and then we found, we figured out, hey, there's going to be a total solar eclipse, and hey, my father's um, hometown is going to be right in the path of totality. And wow, August 11th, that's before the, the term started, so we can actually go and try to see this. Well, um, we made arrangements, and you know, here's my dad, and um, this is my sister, and then, you know, my future ex-brother-in-law, <laughs> time flies. And, well, we actually drove up to a little castle, and he, he lived in a city in the Rhine uh, Plain, and in the Palatinate, so it's a wine-growing region in Germany, it's actually a very nice region. And so we drove up to, um, to a little castle up on the hill, and we were overlooking the, the Rhine Plain. It wasn't all that high up, but, you know, it was high up enough so we could see um, you know, the fields and the villages and everything. 
So we, we had all set up. Of course, there's some nice food around with a stuffed pork stomach and you know beer, which is not shown, or you know, like <laughs> apple juice um, with with soda water. It's a favorite summer drink um, in Germany. So we got all set up, and as you can see, we had, they had glasses back then, the, the same kind of glasses they're still used today. And in fact, I've been giving away all the glasses that I got from from the Decatur campus. Uh, ladies, so we'll be using those same glasses that we used 18 years ago. Okay, so we were hopeful, but as luck would have it, um, it was Germany during the summer. Um, now the weather is a little bit of a different story. Um, you know, Germany is in a climate with summer rain. Um, so as it turned out, oh, just yeah, to kind of show the geography a little bit. Um, you know, here we have Europe, and um, this is approximately the location of my father's hometown. So it's pretty much right at the border um, to France. Mm -hmm. So just like a spinning distance away, and then you know here you have Switzerland, Austria. You're probably familiar that um, in Europe, it's more like the, the equivalent of the states of the United States. You know, you cross, you go a couple hundred miles, and you're in a different country. Um, this is what the castle looks like, and this is sort of the, the view that we had. Um, so continuing on, unfortunately, it was already kind of you know humid, and then well, what happens when more and more of the sun is being blocked out? Well, less and less sunlight and less and less heat reach the atmosphere. So if the atmosphere is already saturated with water, it cools down, and we start to develop fog, you know, clouds. So unfortunately, you know, we, everybody was there with the glasses, and then in, you know, the partially closed went in and out. But then during, during totality, it, it was just clouded over. You, know, you can see through the clouds ten minutes before the eclipse. Here's the you know, with whatever camera we had available, not, definitely not professional. 10 minutes before, this is 30 minutes after, but during, but at least, you know, we were able to experience the environment, you know, the whole atmosphere, um, or not atmosphere, but yeah, around us. So, you know, we noticed the cooler and darker, and we were able to take off our eclipse glasses. Um, and then in the valley below us, um, we saw you know, the street lights come on, um, you know, Germany being Germany. We saw like fireworks going off here and there. We saw cars pulled over. You know, some people were probably caught by surprise, um, as usual. So, so we did get you know that effect, and I'm kind of glad for that because this time I'm hoping I can fully concentrate on the total phase. So, what would we have liked to have seen? Well, you you know what. We would like to have seen this, mm -hmm. and this is something you can only see when you're in the total shadow of the moon. So, if here in Atlanta we're just going to get 97 percent of the sun to be covered by the moon, and that is still enough of the face of the sun that the sunlight is so intense that it would damage your eyes, even though you think it would get dark enough to look at it with the naked eyes, it really won't. And since you don't have red, uh, pain receptors in your retina, you will not feel that your eyes are being damaged. And just this morning, I saw an article online um, from, from a young, well, now an older gentleman, that when he was young and a teenager and looked at the partial phases with his naked eyes, you know, he said he had covered one eye, but he has permanent damage in that eye, like a hole burned in his retina that he lived, had to live with for the rest of his life by looking at it with his naked eye. And that was the partial phase. So you have to keep these glasses on here in Atlanta the entire time. Um, when you drive up north, into the, if you drive up north into the path of totality, and the moon covers the entire face of the sun, then there's no direct sunlight coming at your eyes. And what you see then is sort of the, the, the hazy, um, fizzy corona, which is actually really, really hot, but the light is sort of, sort of scattered in our direction, what we see. And this is where 
the, the um, solar wind is being it, like flung along the magnetic field lines because the sun has a turning magnetic field going on, and then eventually also into space out in all directions. And this this is like, you know, supposedly overwhelming. So we haven't had that experience yet. We're hoping we'll get it today. Now, um, in 1999, when we were, we didn't look at those charts at the time, but I pulled them up, you know, when I got ready for this talk. Um, if you look at the probability of um, cloud cover, which is this red curve here, and here we have um, time along the eclipse path. So I've marked about the time, well, here are some cities that, was, that were hit by the eclipse. Yeah, this was, well, this is, this is Paris. Might have been one, I'm not sure. Well, Paris, Munich. So we were somewhere, um, look, maybe a little bit closer to Paris than we were to Munich. Um, well, turns out the cloud cover was about, you know, the probability of having cloud cover was 58%. So we had less than 50-50 chance of actually seeing um, the totality. So maybe we were lucky to see what we did see. Um, then, of course, there is Mr. Eclipse, who was Mr. Eclipse nearly 20 years ago, and he's still Mr. Eclipse today. Fred Espinach, he's the Eclipse guru, and um, he maintains the official Eclipse website, solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, and huge uh, repository of videos, photographs. Well, he, he is it. What he did, he went to Turkey. Turkey is right here. And of course, it has a totally different summer climate, which is more you near know, like that of a desert. So his chance of getting clouded out was actually just about 25%. And um, yeah, the, the blue bars here are the probability of, um, I think, seeing the eclipse. Let's see what's on the mean cloud level. Well. Anyway, I mean, this is the cloud cover, and this is the likelihood that you're going to see the eclipse. So. Obviously, he was funded by NASA, and he's a professional, so he knew exactly where to go. Um, okay, so now, slow forward, so we had a little, like, an entire life in between. 18 years, well, four pets have passed, two kids have been born, both of us <laughs> were tenured. Well, uh, unfortunately, three parents passed away, but we have eight new pets, and now our kids are teenagers. GPC changed to GSU. <laughs> You know, and the world has gone crazy, but we're almost here, we've almost made it. And so let's, you know, like, President Trump, like we say in Germany, that we'll at least make it to Monday. <laughs> okay, so this is the um, anticipated path. I mean, this is also called the Great American Solar Eclipse because it goes smack dab across the North American continent and even, you know, a, a lot of the populated areas in. Um, South America get at least a partial eclipse. Um, it will start in the west, you know, come up on Oregon here, and the times here are universal time, which is sort of centered on London. Um, but then you'll see it'll stretch all, all the way across the continent, and it's also called a rural eclipse, because it will not really hit any major cities, and maybe that's kind of nice in a way, because you know, the cities always get the limelight, and now, finally, the great equalizer, you know, nature doesn't care, everybody, everybody under the sun literally gets to see the spectacle. It has an equal opportunity here. Um, so it, I think the biggest city it passes through might be Green, no, Greensboro or Nashville. Nashville. Yeah, um, because the path of totality is only about 71 miles wide. That is not a whole lot. And um, so it'll make its way across. And if you stay in any one spot, then this time around, the totality lasts just over two minutes. And that's about the speed that, that the, the 71 diameter shadow, you know, the, the speed of the, the moon passing in its orbit, you know, well, then the shadow will pass by your location. So it's really not all that long. Um, and as you can see here, this strip would be the 90%, so at least most of Georgia is in the 90% um, coverage, and then, of course, you know, it gets less and less covered. So 
So are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Have you made any plans? No. Yes. Yes. What plans? Oh, uh, near Salem. Uh, uh, well, and where? In which? South Carolina. Oh, nice. Oh, that's perfect. It just goes right over here. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, Bill, it, just for my camera, if you check the photograph of the camera. Yeah, you, you may want to check into like solar filters because um, the, the sun, you know, if, you, if you're taking pictures of the partial phases, you know, the lenses will concentrate that light. You know, and of course, it, we don't have the um, film anymore, but we have, um, you know, photo cells or photo receptors in electronics, and that that might get fried. But there are special lenses that you can use, or sun solar filters. So yeah, you, you make one of my money and check into that. Yes. My brother called yesterday to find out about the filters for the camera. They've been sold out for years. This is this people have, have known about this, and it's yeah. hard to get those. Now I was saying it's all it's all over the south, the whole path. Maybe you can order it from German manufacturers and have it shipped overnight. It might be yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or I don't know how well it would work to take one of your, you know, I don't want to, I'm not a professional photographer, so don't take my advice, but to, to take those solar eclipse glasses and just put one of those in front of the camera. You know, where can we get those glasses? Well, uh, I, I handed some out. I don't know, they, they, they might be out right now. But if you go, um, there, there's an Eclipse Viewing event at Decatur Campus. Um, Susanna Lomont, um, our astronomy um, professor down at Decatur Campus, she's conducting it. So she will have at the event for, for people who come and hand out um, more of those classes. And also if you go to local libraries, they may still have some, um, yeah, check with museums. Um, Fernbank, they, they all have an event, I don't, I'll, I'll have links to that. Tell us Science Museum, or, yes, um, some uh, eye doctors have them. My oh, doctor. yes, that's that's a good tip. So, yeah, check, yeah, maybe even with your um, HMO or your eye doctor, call them up. They, they might have some, too. Because, yeah, there, there's, with so many people viewing the eclipse and the risk of people damaging their eyes, you know, they, they don't want to see the emergency room flooded. You know, with people having, having vision problems. Um, okay, yeah, you said Carolina. Yeah, this is Greenville, South Carolina. So th these are our chances now in terms of um, the, the cloud cover. So did we approve? Well, Bill and I, we made arrangement to go with, with our family to a um, small bed and breakfast in Sylvan Falls, which is, which is in Ragoon, Ragoon, Raven, Raven Raven County. Raven, yeah. uh, I can never really pronounce that right. Um, you can, it's kind of interesting with this cloud cover curve, you can sort of tell almost what kind of geography you have or, or what, you know, if you start at the Pacific Ocean over here, I've highlighted the 50% cloud cover uh, or chance it to be cloudy. Mark, well, this is the Pacific Ocean. You know, of course, you have a lot of moisture. Then it drops down. Oregon actually has a very good chance of not being covered by clouds. And then, you know, we're coming up to the Rockies, which, of course, you know, that you get moisture being pushed up, condensing, you get more clouds. And then, beyond the, um, the Rockies here in, in Wyoming, Casper, Wyoming, then it drops down. And of course, you yeah, have like the, the continental America, which, which are probably the best places to watch it. Um, then here, St. Joseph, Missouri, St. Louis. Um, but then when we come up to the Appalachians, <laughs> unfortunately, so that's that, that blip here, and uh, Raglan Gap, of course, is in the mountains. <coughs> so we're getting this, this peak here. Well, 50%, at least it's now we have a coin toss. So it's better than we improved by about 8%. So, so we're still sort of not quite sure if we're going to make it. But then um, all of GSU will be in the same boat because it turns out that the astronomers, the astronomy department from the downtown campus actually has an event at the Nakuchi School at Rob Gap. We didn't know that. 
because we, we booked our plans, I think, way before they did. But they're going to set up on the athletic fields of the Nakuchi School, and there will be live music, there will be you know, food for purchase, there will be activities, you know, professors and graduate students. Uh, then officially registered event with NASA, so they'll have like a big screen TV where, where they have live coverage from, from NASA and other locations. And we're kind of like, okay, shall we go there or shall we just have our own private little thing? Because, you know, the good thing with the solar eclipse is you don't have to go to any special place. You step outside, it's going to be in the middle of the day, so you don't even have to worry that much about, you know, trees along the horizon or, you know, buildings or mountains. It's going to be directly above you. You can be on the sidewalk, you can be in a parking lot, you can be in the back walk, you can be on a lake. So there's lots of area for all those people, you know, to go and see the eclipse. Arika, is there a charge or a reservation that has to be made for the thing at uh, the cushion? Yes, um, I don't, yeah, let, let, me, let me get, I have some information, but it's definitely, it's just a $5 cover charge, um, but there may be a limited number of tickets, and I don't know if they, they might be sold out already. Um, just a quick quiz, sorry, pop quiz, <laughs> didn't announce it much. But um, just to see where we're at, um, so they're not just solar eclipses, but they're also lunar eclipses. Uh, how many of you have seen a lunar eclipse? Yeah, actually that's probably much more likely. Um, it's really neat, but unfortunately it usually happens at night. And um, it's not quite as spectacular, so, so maybe not quite as memorable. Okay, but just to get the differences, um, in a solar eclipse, which object is being blocked? The sun. The sun. Lunar eclipse, which object is being blocked? The moon. Very good. And in the solar eclipse, which object does the blocking? The moon. In the lunar eclipse? Earth. 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 Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, it was not it was not a setup or anything. But um, you know, they have these three spheres, and yeah, it, gets, it gets a little bit confusing, because sometimes it even happens to me when I speak too fast, then or my students, I know exactly what they mean, but they put the wrong sphere label in the wrong place. Okay, but um, going a little deeper, during a solar eclipse, what phase is the moon in? Doesn't matter. Does it matter? It, it matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has to be new, because only, only then does it have the chance to be in between the Earth and the Sun. Doesn't happen all the time, and we'll talk about why, but it has to be new. Um, what about the lunar eclipse? What phase of the moon? Full. Oh. It has to be full, because it has to have the possibility to pass directly behind the Earth through its shadow. And that only happens when the moon is full. Then we, uh, where can we see a total eclipse from Earth, total solar eclipse? In that small, little, narrow path, yes, which is 71 miles, um, it can be a little bit wider depending on, see the, the moon's orbit is a little bit elliptic, so there are times when solar eclipses occur when it's a little bit closer to the Earth, that means it covers up even more and the path of the shadow is wider, so it can last, in that case, it can, I think a total eclipse, total solar eclipse can last up to seven minutes. But then, when the moon is at its furthest away from the Earth during a solar eclipse, then it's not quite large enough in the sky to cover all of the sun. Then we get what's called an annular eclipse. So it never gets total, even in, in the center path. And you'll always see a ring of the sun around um, the moon. There we go, see? <laughs> OK, um, yes, lunar eclipse, well, the um, moon passes through the Earth's shadow, so you can see it from anywhere in the night sun. So, so that's the beauty of it. And then, well, for how long? Um, I alluded to that already. It sort of depends on you know the just a few minutes if you're lucky, because the lunar shadow is so small and it moves so fast. But then we can see the entirety of the moon passing into the Earth's shadow, passing through the Earth's shadow, and the Earth's shadow is a lot bigger 
but in a moon's shadow. So it takes the moon, you know, a couple of, the whole thing, starting with a partial and then passing across, that can take two and a half hours. So that's a lot more time. Okay, so here's the key. I <laughs> don't have to talk about that. Okay, very quickly, well, we have a new moon and a full moon every month. Why don't we see solar and lunar eclipses every month? Well, that's because it turns out, oh, wait a minute, this is for the lunar phases. Okay, let me just show you um, a video real quick. Lunar phases, okay, we, have, we have a moon here. <laughs> There's here a dog emoji toy. Um, but basically, you know, the, the sun always l lights up exactly half of all our planets and moons and everything else. You know, and the other half is always in the night. Now, as the moon orbits around the Earth, we just see different amounts of its day side and different amounts of its night side. So during a new moon, we don't see any of its day side, and because it's up during the day, and we see none of its day side, there's no light reflected in our direction, so that's why we cannot see the face of the new moon um, during a normal day. But then, you know, as the moon orbits around the Earth, we see more and more of the day side of the moon. So during the full moon, we see all of the day side of the moon. And then, of course, it keeps orbiting around the Earth, so then it moves back into a position where we see less and less of the day side of the moon until we're back in the new moon. Okay, so let me just show, um, one of, let me show you this video here, this, this side view. I think that's probably more the most yeah. illustrative video. Yeah, there's no sound to it. You can see how fast the Earth is spinning. So, you know, you can see the sun. This is the new moon now. And you'll start seeing waxing crescent, that quarter waxing gibbous, and now it approaches new. You know, you see the night side of the Earth spinning there in this direction. Then it'll go through the waning phases. But I like this perspective because it sort of gives you the sense that, okay, we're looking at it from Earth, and you know, you, you kind of get a sense of um, how everything is arranged. So this was by the European Southern Observatory. Next slide. Okay, this is now, I want to make a quick demo here. Um, this is the real reason why we don't get eclipses every single month. And that is because the orbit of the moon is inclined with respect to the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So let's say I'm the sun, <laughs> this is the Earth, and this cardboard plane is the plane in which the Earth orbits around the sun. Okay, and now we have the moon. Okay, so here we have our friendly little moon. And um, while the moon orbits around the Earth, sort of, well, I'd have to make it spin so that it always shows the same face towards the Earth, but it sort of orbits on a slant. And as the Earth orbits around the sun, you know, that slant it, it sometimes happens that the moon is full when it passes through the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. See, and if we're, if we're back here, then, um, let's see, it might be, the, the full moon might be above. And when we're here, the moon might get full right when it's passing behind the Earth. And similar with the new moon. So because the, the moon is orbiting at a slant, it only happens about two or three times a year that the alignment is so that the moon happens to be new or full while it passes through the Earth's orbital plane. And those are the only chances when the, the moon's shadow can pass directly 
across the Earth's surface, or the moon can pass directly through the Earth's shadow. Because, you know, those shadows are cast directly behind these objects. So, you know, if, if the moon is full or new above the Earth, or let's see, higher than the North Pole, or lower than the South Pole, then the new moon, th there's no way that the, the moon's shadow could fall on the surface of the Earth. By the same token, if it, if it is full um, above or below the Earth, it misses the Earth's shadow. So you don't get any eclipses then. That's why eclipses are so rare, and this is such a special event. Um, let me show you one quick video that's also um, an animation. Um, it actually shows the sun, uh, sorry, the, the Earth and the moon and the orbit and the sizes to scale. So just to give you a sense of how difficult this arrangement actually is. Okay, well, I guess that, that won't be happening then. But um, if you, it's too bad. Well, if you get a chance, um, if you if you can go to to the NASA website and um, or the, yes, see that video. It's it's pretty amazing because it shows exactly how the shadow, you know, passes over, and then the next cycle how it passes it, it hits directly on the surface of the Earth. So so that's and, and you get everything in scale. So that's um, pretty good. Okay, now um, just a little bit about the different parts of the shadow. Okay, I've tried to come up with a little demo. Um, here's my little space guide. This is actually a gift that Bill got from one of his students. And yeah, a little space guy here is a lamp. And yeah, I'm, I, don't, I can't set this up um, right now, but I just wanted to show you this is a light source, and there are actually like two little light sources, like his eyes. Okay, and what happens when I put a pen, the tip of a pen, and have the two light sources shine on um, the tip of the pen, I'm getting, well, two light sources, I'm getting two shadows, one from each light source. So these are the two shadows, but it turns out where they overlap, that is where I get total shadow. But when I only see one, the shadow of one light from the other light source, there's only partial shadow. And that's sort of like what it is, because the sun is not a point light source, but the sun is an extended light source. So when, when we see the partial phases, you know, we can still, we, we still receive the light from most of the sun or part of the sun, so it only gets a little bit dimmer. So, so that's what's called we are in the pen number in the region of partial shadow. And only when the moon totally blocks the sun, so that would be the equivalent of being here in, in the center um, cone, where if, if I would stand here, I wouldn't see any of the two light sources coming at me. It would be completely blocked by the pen. So then you have the total shadow. Um, let me just give Phil his chance to do a little bit of explaining here. What's happening physically in space is that the moon is casting a long shadow. Usually that shadow misses the Earth, but during an eclipse the moon's shadow falls on the Earth's surface. In fact, there are two shadows on the moon, one inside the other. One is a narrow cone tapering to a point away from the moon. If you were anywhere physically inside this cone, the moon appears big enough to completely block the sun. That means the shadow is very dark, and we call it the umbra, which is Latin for, you guessed it, shadow. Outside of this deep umbral shadow is a wider conical region where, if you're in it, the sun is only partially blocked. You can still see some of the sun past the moon. You're getting less light, and so you're technically shadowed, but it's not quite as dark as the umbra. This region is called the pen umbra. Pen, in this case, for Latin, meaning almost or nearly. When the umbra touches the Earth, we get a total solar eclipse. But what does that look like from the ground? You don't get a total solar eclipse right away. First, the edge of the moon slips in front of the sun, and we see a little dip in the sun's limb, its edge, as seen from the Earth. That's the start of the pen umbra sweeping over. As the moon slowly moves, that dip grows, becoming a bite. The sun becomes a thick crescent, then a thin one. As the sun becomes an ever thinner crescent, the sky begins to darken. Then, finally, the moon's black disk completely covers the sun. The umbra sweeps over your location. And at that moment, 
totality begins. You might think that this just means the sky gets dark and it's like night outside for a while. But a total eclipse is far more than that, and that's because of the sun's corona. As I'll cover in more detail in a future episode, the corona is the sun's atmosphere an ethereally thin envelope of gas that stretches from the sun's surface into space for millions of kilometers. It's really faint and therefore usually completely overwhelmed by the intensely bright light from the sun. But when the moon blocks the sun's face, the corona becomes visible. It surrounds the sun, filaments and tendrils extending into the sky, an incredibly beautiful sight. I know many people who said it's the most spectacular thing they have ever seen. And there's more. The moon's edge isn't smooth. There are craters and other depressions. Craters right at the moon's edge allow sunlight to stream past. We see these as bright patches around the eclipsed sun, which are called Bailey's beads, because they were first described by English astronomer Francis Bailey in 1836. Because the moon and sun are very nearly the same apparent size, totality is brief. The longest it can last is only about seven or eight minutes. That's how long it takes the umbra to move over one spot on the Earth. When totality ends and the moon starts to move off of the sun's face, for a moment, just a single spot of the sun is unblocked, glowing fiercely on one side of the moon. Sometimes you can get a circle of light around the moon's surface, and together with the bright spot, it looks like a celestial wedding ring. In fact, this is called the diamond ring effect. Then, inexorably, the moon pulls away from the sun, and the order of events is reversed. The upper is gone, but you're still in the penumbral shadow. The sun shows a thin crescent, then a thick one, then a dip in its side, and then it's all over. The umbral shadow of the moon is pretty small when it hits the Earth, so a total eclipse is a local event. If you're too far north and south, you don't get a total eclipse, you only get a partial one, which is still cool, but lacks the mystique of a total eclipse. Well, actually, it's kind of funny, he goes on to say that he's never seen a total eclipse. So it makes me feel, you know, good that I'm not the only astronomy person who hasn't seen a total eclipse. So he's definitely out there chasing the total eclipse on Monday. And he has a blog, so I'm hoping to, to hear about that too. Um, so where will you be and who will you be with? So it's maybe something you might want to think about too. You know, it's my choice, so do I go with a crowded sea and then bla you know, blaring action or a more private experience? Um, you, you definitely want to think about that. Um, now, let's see, you can see eclipses happen all over the world, and unfortunately, most of the time, since the path is so narrow, you may have heard of eclipse cruises. They're very popular and, and very expensive, um, or planes, um, there are special planes that try to stay in the path of totality and fly with the moon as fast as it can, so to extend that time from just two minutes to maybe, I don't know how much they can get up to, because of uh, shadow moves pretty fast. Yeah, and then of course you get animal lovers who also don't want their ant, their pets to get their retina damaged. So you'll, you'll see all kinds of interesting things happening. Um, let's see, there's one video that I wanted to, yeah. Um, yeah, let me show you this. This is a, a short video, um, a geostationary satellite. This is what it looks like when, when the path of totality or the moon's shadow actually sweeps across the Earth's surface. I think this sort of goes into a repeat loop. It's just so brief. So here you can see it. That's that's what it looks like. And, and now while it sort of re rewinds and then it does it over and over. Like this, this, and only those people in the very center can see the total eclipse. The people along the edges, they will see a partial eclipse. And this is, as you can see, mostly across the Pacific Ocean. I hope it's the Pacific, yeah. Okay, um, then there is a news report from 2016. This is the moment that millions had waited to see. The moon passing between the Earth and the Sun, creating a total eclipse. The Sun's light was blocked out for four minutes over Indonesia and the Central Pacific, turning day into night. Only its corona, the faint ring around the edge, was visible before the moon continued its journey, revealing the Sun once again. This is where it could be seen. 
That red strip is 150 kilometers wide. Anyone beneath it would have seen the total eclipse. Those to the north, as far as the Philippines, and to the south, as far as Australia, would have seen only a partial eclipse. Though in some places, people were left disappointed by the cloudy skies blocking their view. This is how it looked from Thailand, where the moon covered about two-fifths of the sun. People gathered at the Bangkok Planetarium using telescopes to get a good sighting, while others used special filter viewers. Those are solar telescopes. The sky wasn't as clear, and only a partial eclipse was seen, but it's still great that we saw it from Thailand. Similar enthusiasm in Singapore, where the eclipse was 90%. And in Indonesia, where it was total, and people were plunged briefly into complete darkness. And this rare astronomical event won't happen again until August 2017, and next time it will be visible from North America. Ben Bland, BBC News. Okay, so this was the polished um, British broadcast um, re report, and now I'm, I just want to play the first minute and a half of this video. This is an unfiltered reaction of a, of a a uh, private citizen on the Faroe Islands. He must have been knowledgeable about um, taking the eclipse because it has a really good image of it. But just listen to it. <laughs> safety aspect, um, you know, we've been handing out these glasses and by now they're, they're getting pretty hard to find. Um, I'm on a neighborhood list and somebody had just said yesterday, oh, Walmart, just got some in, gotta go to Walmart. <laughs> um, and again, yeah, check local libraries, um, universities or colleges, or um, you know, as Betty suggested, check with your eye doctor. Um, those are all sources where you can get these kind of glasses and you have to make sure that they are certified. So there has to be a, a certification um, number printed in it, and um, they have to be from reputable companies because this close to the solar eclipse, there are um, a lot of people who might sell fakes, and then you think your eyes are protected, but they're really not, and you, you wind up with permanent eye damage. So you really want to make sure, um, yeah, Rainbow Symphony, I think I have a list later, also, if you go to um, the American Association um, of the American Astronomical Society, um, and I'm going to, um, you know, give this PowerPoint to you so that you have access to all these links. They they have a really good write up about it. So if you have these glasses, they must be so dark that you see no, nothing else other than the sun. So if you put those glasses on, they should be completely dark. 
It's like, you know, what, what, what's the point of these? But you could look through those classes at the sun any time. You, just, you don't have to wait for an eclipse. You know, you, you could go outside right now, put them on, and look at the sun. But the sun should be the only light source you see, and make sure that the glasses don't have holes in them, um, they're not scratched or kinked or anything. Um, and the sun should also look, you know, like a crisp circle. So it shouldn't be murky or, or anything like that. So I just wanted you to um, be careful. Also, um, Phil Plate does a pretty good job explaining. Oh, thank you. Also, yes. um, because, I wear, um, because I wear glasses, I yes. had asked um, some guy that we went to see at um, on the Beltline they were doing a thing, and he said to make sure that the glasses, that the eclipse glasses, go in front of your eyeglasses, because if you put them behind your eyeglasses, the lenses of oh, your glasses yes. will act like yes. um, magnifiers, and what it'll do is burn a hole through the eclipse glasses and damage your retina. It might even melt them. So if you wear eyeglasses, make sure you put the eclipse glasses on the outside. That's that, that's a very good point. Yeah, you know, especially I if, if you're about that. Yeah, far uh, if you're nearsighted, but yeah, then it tries to focus. Mm -hmm. It'll magnify. Yeah, because because yeah, I'm I'm, I'm nearsighted, so it'll you know try to focus it. Yeah, so so that's a very good point. Um, make sure that you put them on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, that I, I never even thought of. I automatically put them on the outside, but you know you never know. You know, if you know, people don't know. They're all. I've heard that saying. They're all permutations of wrong. That's <laughs> when, when I'm cooking. That's really what I go through. Um, Solar eclipse. You can go permanently and completely blind. That's really not true. But. Some parts of eclipse watching are more dangerous than others. I mean, obviously, it's not a good idea to stand there and stare at the sun. Looking at even the uneclipsed sun for more than a moment is painful, and that pain is the result of the damage that solar radiation is doing to your retinas. So I don't recommend it. Duh. But when viewing an eclipse, the real concern is right after totality ends. During totality, it's dark, so your pupils can dilate to let more light in. But then there's the flash of sunlight when the moon moves off and that's intense enough to damage your retinas. That's why astronomers recommend extreme caution when viewing an eclipse, because that flash can catch you by surprise. When viewing the sun, don't just stand there and stare at it. You should always have eye protection. And make sure you have safety-approved filters. Don't try the homemade tricks you might have heard of, like looking through an old CD or DVD, or using old-style camera film as a filter. These can let through too much infrared and ultraviolet light, and again, can dilate your pupils, actually making things worse. Lots of companies make inexpensive filters that are great for sunspotting. We have links in the doobly-doo for more information on eye safety. Now, you don't have to worry about hurting your eyes at all when viewing a lunar eclipse, because in that case, it's the Earth that blocks the sun, and the Earth's shadow falls on the moon. So go nuts! But one big difference between the two kinds of eclipses is who can see them. A solar eclipse is localized to one spot on the Earth, or really, a swath along the ground as the moon's umbral shadow sweeps across the Earth's surface. But a lunar eclipse is when the moon moves into Earth's shadow, so anyone on Earth facing the moon can see a lunar eclipse. This is why I've seen dozens of lunar eclipses, but never a total solar one. I've never been at the right place at the right time. Not that I'm there. The we're rooting for you, Phil. It's going to happen. <laughs> so the website for this uh, crash course you gave me on the first page, but it was just um, yeah. You can you can just um, go to youtube.com and then type in crash course astronomy, and then he, he has like forty plus shows of all kinds of different things. I think yeah, that's that's the second of I think number two. So that's, that's one of the early ones. Well, if you don't have Eclipse classes, and there are probably going to be plenty of people who, who are striking out this late in the game, there's a way that um, people can still enjoy the Eclipse. And, and that's really a very simple thing. And it's called pinhole or pinhole camera. And all you really have to do is punch a little hole in, into a piece of sheet of paper or a piece of cardboard and then have the sun f with you know the eclipse going on falling it's light passing through that hole and then behind the hole you have a screen and then you sort of you can adjust the distance of the screen and you will see a nice perfect image of the eclipse as it is in progress so so that is one way and yeah what Bill and I, we actually uh, saw a partially eclipse in uh, 1994. 
what's really me, and you know, I've, I've had someone ask me, oh yeah, somebody told me, in order to see the eclipse, you have to drive north, if there's nothing going on in the here in Atlanta, it's like, what? It's gonna be 97%. I mean, that's still gonna be very, very, very spectacular. And in fact, what, what you see during the partial eclipses is um, any kind of, if the sunlight passes through the trees, you know, they're, they're like all these little holes that it passes through, or you can, yeah, um, maybe I'll show that in the next page. Um, any kind of holes that you can make where the sun passes through or that exist in nature like bushes, trees, they will make little images of the solar eclipse. So that, that's one of the, um, yeah, there it is. I guess I gotta fast forward since I'm talking about that right now. Where is that? <laughs> since I'm talking about that right now, yeah. it's, it's yeah. amazing. It's like shimmering. Yes, it's like yes. Shimmering. Little it's really diamonds. Yeah. And, and we, we didn't, no. we didn't yeah. know yeah. that we were going to see yeah. them. Yeah. So, so that's kind of one of the things that you usually don't hear about. But when, yeah. wow, what's going on? You know, everyone's sidewalk on house walls. And, you know, so it, it's really worth it, even though this is not going to get told here. It's really worth it to go out and, and watch the entire event. And here's someone, you know, who kind of holds his fingers like that and makes perfect little images there. Um, and you can, for example, these images, you can take pictures of these images with your camera or, or film, you know, try to videotape that. Um, yeah, I wanted to announce on the CARE campus from 1 to 2.40 p.m., uh, so Susanna Lomont is set up with telescopes and solar filters and she's also handing out the eyeglasses to, uh, to go with it. Um, so we'll have 97% of totality. And another thing, this is also kind of interesting, since you know the eclipse passes across the entire United States, I don't know if you've heard about citizen science? Have you, have you heard about these projects? Or pro it's sort of like uh, crowdsourcing science. Um, and what NASA is doing and, and other places, they want people to, to sort of pay attention not just to the sun, and the moon, but also what happens to the wildlife around them, or the air temperature. You know, how what do they experience in addition to, you know, what they see, and then write that down and send that to them. So, that, so their websites for people who are interested. So, don't just watch the sun and the moon, but also you know, see what is depending on the setting you're in, like on a lake, or you know, if you're out in nature, um, what happens to the birds, to the insects, you know. Just try to take it in with all your senses. So let's see another. Um, yeah, just maybe I can uh, walk back a little later. Yes. I have a question. Uh, how much does the solar eclipse affect the gravitational force of the moon? Is it magnified? Is it um, oh well, it's, it's, it's for, yes. <laughs> because, because of the alignment, you get the um, highest possible high tides and the lowest possible low tides. So you get, you get the biggest difference in, in the high and low tides on those states. So it exacerbates the uh, if, gravitational forces? Yes, it's usually not noticeable, but you know, but, well, not, not for us. It's not like you step on a scale like, oh my God. No, but for example, if there are hurricanes or, um, or you know, events like that, if they happen during an, a lunar or solar eclipse, Yes, then that, that will, they will have especially high storm surges and, and cause much more damage because you know the, the ocean water is much more malleable, so you know it'll it'll be pulled by the gravitational force or the, the lack thereof, you know, on the other side. Um, yes, you, you'll get much higher storm surges, much more damage, and of course that's going to become a much bigger problem as sea levels are rising. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's going to occur for like three hours, like from like one, four, five to four, five. You know, you're out during the day driving in it, and you need the glasses on. Well, you don't need the glasses if you're not looking at the sun. But when you're in the car, the sun's all around you. Is that a no? Thing? Not not more than than usual. I mean, usually when when you drive around, see the thing is, you don't look purposely into the sun ever. You know, I, I know what you mean. You know, when, when you're driving in a direction, you know, you're putting the, sh the sunshade down, um, it's, it's not going to be any, any different. You know, the sun is just going to get 
uh, cover it up, so it's actually going to get less intense than, than it normally would be. So you don't have to change any of your normal behavior. It's just that, you know, people, since they see the, the sun being covered and getting darker, they might be tempted to now look more into the sun than they normally would. And that's, that's where it becomes dangerous. So if you just go about your normal business and, you know, it's like, okay, remember, oh, I do want to look at the sun, let me put on the glasses. But I, you don't have to worry about anything if you don't directly stare at the sun, you know, for an extended time period. And if you stare in your house and you look out through your window, you still need glasses. To be sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't take any chances. Yeah, yes. When you said if we go to the campus, they will have glasses. Yes, yes, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure because, yes, yeah, Susanna, she had like a whole, that was in the spring, it might be down to that, but, <laughs> but yes, I'm, I'm very sure that she will have glasses to hand out. In fact, I've heard um, that the public schools in, um, well, at least in Grand County, but maybe also in other areas, in the metro area, they'll hand out, I mean, they, they're delaying the buses. Um, so, for example, um, our high school, where, where our kids go, they'll um, send all the kids to the, um, Stadium, and you know, so they they all can watch the solar eclipse from there, and then they'll all get glasses, and then the buses will just leave the school instead of at two thirty, you know, just right around the time the eclipse happens, um, maybe an hour later or so. So you, that's another thing you you want to be sure of. Let's see, let me um, go back to the previous slides to get ready locally. Um, Yeah, let, me, let me show you this slide. This is basically a traffic advisory, and um, all the um, Department of Transportation, so they have been advised that this solar eclipse is a planned special event for which uh, there has been no recent precedent in the United States. So basically, they can only guess at what might happen. So you pretty much have to be prepared for you know, maybe it'll go well, but there might be traffic mayhem, who, who knows? So you, you want to make your preparations. They call it a planned special event that is a feat of nature, not man-made. <laughs> We're not in control. The President of the United States is not in control. Sorry to say that. Um, a planned, <laughs> planned special event with many different events across the country. And in fact, if you go to nationaleclipse.com, slash events.html. Um, those are the events that are going on and they list them state by state and the GSU event in Radwin County and also, I think they also have an event downtown. So uh, all these will be listed. Um, an act of nature that is not a disaster. <laughs> yeah, just kind of like that, that connotation. So don't panic, just be prepared. Um, so be sure, you know, on, on the day of, you definitely want to check the local news, um, check with the DOT, just, you know, if there's like any special um, plans going on or, you know, situations out of the ordinary that people have to take into account when they go about their day. So they may, there, there may be some transportation plans. Um, so be, be on the lookout for that. Um, also, if you're planning to drive anywhere, well, you may, of course, you will see the eclipse from the highway, but I don't think that's the kind of place, the surroundings that you have in mind for an epic experience like that. Like I said, anywhere where there's no shade, you'll be able to see the eclipse. Um, yeah, if you're planning on driving north, uh, make sure you leave early. I mean, Atlanta, we're one of the biggest um, air, you know, airport hubs in, in the southeast, so we'll get a lot of eclipse hunters. Um, coming in or people who visit their relatives, you know, to take advantage of the situation. So highways will be clogged, um, you know, get, get out early. Also, the, you know, everybody will be on social media trying to send out their personal experiences to everybody else in their network and people, every, you know, they will follow. Oh, I know somebody is in the path. But what are they up to? What are they live streaming? So there's no guarantees that, that the internet will function well or at all, it might be spotty, better in some places, not in others. So even if you have a GPS, don't rely on the GPS only. And I know I'm, you know, <laughs> talking to the choir here, we all know how to read maps, but you know, younger folks, 
they don't have any map reading skills. You know, they rely on the GPS. So they, they might want to just, you know, brush up on that a little bit. Um, also, if you're driving out into the countryside, you know, as, as if you're planning for an adventure. Bring your first aid kit, make sure, you know, it's going to be as freaking hot as when you're out in the sun. You know, usually when we're out in the middle of the day, we try to be in the shade. But if you want to watch the sun, you know, you have to get out there you know, and face it. So it's going to get really hot. Um, make sure you have traffic apps, weather apps, eclipse apps, um, you know, have the radio on. Um, sunscreen, bug spray, water, food. It's kind of, kind of like a scout, you know, like you're going out on a scouting trip. Just without the tent, but pretty much you want to have everything else ready. Make sure your gas tank is full. The gas stations will be mobbed. You know, they're like Kodak little towns. They're going to get, you know, so many people they've never seen before. So, so it's, going to, it's going to be making for some really interesting um, reports. Strong batteries, make sure your tires are good. <laughs> And um, be patient and have a sense of humor. You know, the thing is, we don't know. It's probably going to be cloudy in some places. And, um, you know, we sort of have put our eggs in one basket. You know, we won't be able to move around that much. But um, if you want to stay mobile, you know, keep track of where the clouds are at the time. And, you know, if things don't go as planned, and chances are they won't, you know, just maintain your sense of humor. There will be lots of people out there who are in the same boat. So it's going to be an experience. It's going to be epic. We just don't know which way it's going to go. <laughs> okay, so yeah, these are just the specifics. If you're staying put, um, yeah, this is sort of the 97% the line down here, the 98% line. Um, at Decatur campus, I'm just pointing out a little bit to where Bill and I, where we live. But, um, so the eclipse starts at about 1.06 p.m. The maximum is reached at 2.37 p.m. And this, I need to fix that this is supposed to be 4.02 p.m. So that's basically when the last bit of the moon moves away from the face of the sun. So those are the pertinent times. It starts at 1.06 when you start seeing the moon, you know, the little dip, you know, the bite, <laughs> kind of like how Phil puts it. Maximum at 2.37, and that's 4, 4.02 p.m. when the moon finally moves off. And watch traffic before and after. <laughs> so, and, um, yeah, these are the, the local events. Um, if you go to the Atlanta Journal Constitution, they have an information page about it. I would imagine that they update that information regularly. So keep, keep checking back with the AJC. Um, th yeah, this is um, the link for on, on Georgia State. Um, both the downtown event and the uh, Ravon Gap event are on there. Georgia Tech has events related, and, and I, I think in all those, they will hand out the solar eclipse glasses. Fernbank Science Center, Talis Science Museum, the University of Georgia also has a viewing event, and I think they might even be closer then they, they might be at 98 or 99 percent. Yeah, probably 98. Um, yeah, then these are the um, citizen science projects in case you're interested. Um, so I, I just have a whole bunch of resources there. Um, all, all this, you know, I'll forward the PowerPoint to um, Barbara, right? Yes, thank you. And um, yeah, she'll um, post it for everyone. Well, what if you miss this one? <laughs> Um, there's, the next one is not too far down the road, so it's 2024, um, just in, in about seven years. But you'd have to drive there. You know, this one, the Great American Eclipse, it's right on our doorstep. So, you know, any way we should try to see at least what's happening out in our backyard, even if we don't make it to totality. So this one comes for free. The next one, you know, we have to travel to Texas or I think this is Arkansas, maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, Missouri, yeah, St. Louis, yeah, Kentucky. They, they get lucky here, you know, right around the, um, is that the Kentucky River? So we, we used to live in Kentucky, so that might be, and then here, well, Mississippi is here. But, but anyway, so, so these guys have hit the jackpot. You know, if, if they miss, miss it in 2017, you know, right here in um, Indiana, Kentucky, 
right around here. They can they can see it again in 2024. Or then, you know, if you wanted to travel to um, Ohio and then New York, well, I guess Pennsylvania is feeling a little bit left out there. But um, anyway, so this is really the opportunity that, that it's, it's a golden opportunity. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to give this presentation today and I hope you all will have a great experience and lots of stories to tell, you know, to, to your relatives that, that are living elsewhere. So let me just leave it at that and send you on your way. I had a question though, yes, that your The folklore around as far back as spirituality will take us, what are some of the stories about what people think or what were thinking in those days about what was happening? Well, I might not be a good person to ask because I'm, you know, science. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, did they think that the world was coming yes, to an end? If, you know? Yeah, pe see, people, if they weren't able to predict it, I mean, it's like, oh my, yes, they, they, they had this feeling of foreboding and then probably doom. Because in the middle of the day, you know, the sun and the moon, they have such a great influence on, on your life and, and determine, you know, the seasons and, you know, pretty much. I would imagine that in yes. the beginning they thought, oh my God. Yes, and, and that's in fact, yeah, a lot of cultures, they may still be very superstitious. Um, and while well, I, I was just thinking about the Maya, because you know, we happen to, um, I mean, they, they were astronomically. So, so if there was a chance that you had a culture where, where people could start to predict those patterns, um, then their kings could use that to their advantage and say, hamana, 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 hamana. I See, I'm a god, you know, you need to do what I say, or I'll have the sun strike you dead or something. So, so yes, I, and I mean, way back in, in past ages, the, the astrology or the spirituality, the, the religious aspect and the science aspect, they were actually tied together. So, so the, the astronomer who, who made the charts and predicted when things happened was also the spiritual leader. And, and then, you know, later it, it sort of kind of separated. But um, that, that is a very good point. And I'm actually wondering, um, like, in the path, in the rural path of the eclipse along the Appalachians, so in, in regions where, you know, science and news don't really get all that far, or people, you know, just kind of are sort of in their little silos, how they will feel about this occasion. In fact, one of the gym instructors, well, <laughs> because I'm doing a little bit of boxing now, I'm kind of riled up at the moment. But um, I asked him, oh yeah, I brought him a pair of these solar eclipse glasses. And what? He didn't even know that, that an eclipse was going to happen, and he didn't know what an eclipse was. And I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> but, but then he said, yeah, well, in, in, in addition to traveling around different gyms, you know, where he's teaching boxing to people, uh, regular people, you know, not... <laughs> Uh, but he, he also has a job where he has to get up at 3 a.m., so he hardly listens to the news, or he's not on social media because he was a little bit older, like 52. You know, he's just not tuned in. And I said, well, you know, even if you haven't heard anything about it yet, so I talked about on, on last Monday, there's no way you will be able to escape it. You know, you, you'll mm -hmm. see stuff sooner or later, and here he glasses, go out and watch it. You can't miss this. So, yes. <laughs> It's going to be interesting. Yes. So if you make that thing when you have the, the pinhole.